I think I'll. I will try and use this so it'll make it a little bit easier. So I'm sorry. Because I have a tendency to, to speak too soft sometimes, which so I'm sorry if that happens. So let me get this going, and um, I want to, um, to to challenge some thoughts that you may have about bullying, um, because you know we've all grown up with it. We all we all had bullying going on around us. It goes on around us all the time, and that you know something we have to understand about bullying is that bullying is a symptom. It is not the underlying problem. It is a symptom of an underlying problem. It's telling us that there's a problem there. And until we can actually get to that problem and help that child find a different way to medicate that underlying problem, they're gonna to continue to bully. They're gonna to continue to do that because it's a learned behavior. Um, the epicenter of bullying is usually around middle school. You know, it's where it's the most obvious. Um, but it can start earlier, and people continue that, that the bullying practice all the way up. We just get more sophisticated at it. So by the time we get to the workplace, we're really good at covering it up and using it, again, to medicate what's wrong with us, but what we're having trouble with. Um, but it's, it's something we've learned. It's something that we got results from, so we're gonna continue to do it. So we'll touch more on that as we go through it. I'll show you some of the things of where it comes from and why and we can talk a bit about corrective stuff, but um, let me show you a couple of things here. Uh, first thing I want to ask you, is, as kind of as we look globally, is kind of my three questions. First question is, when did we decide that some other human beings were disposable? When did we decide that? You know, our earliest ancestors didn't do that. Um, they needed everybody in their family or their tribe or their group to stay alive. They needed them for survival. So they found ways to help people correct their actions and reintegrate them back into their society in meaningful ways. Now they weren't great humanitarians. It's just, it was you know, practical. They needed the people, they couldn't lose them. You lost people all the time. But somewhere along the way, we lost track of that. Now we did have a person who walked on earth um, who was sent here to help us. Um, and that person would have tried very hard to teach us that no one was disposable. Um, but, you know, we, and, we, and we still think about that person. We talk about him on Sundays. We talk about him, we pray to him. Um, but a lot of times we don't follow the teachings that we do. We don't, we don't follow what we were taught about how, how important love is, um, how powerful love is, and how much we have to use that and think about that. And that we don't, we don't have the right to, to dispose of people. We need to reintegrate people into our society in meaningful ways, from this size to this size. So that's the first question. The second question is, is punishment the only way to correct negative behavior? Um, we live in a punishment-based society. We, we think that we can, can punish anybody into to doing what we want them to do, or into being better. Oh, we can't. We can't do that. All we can do is punish them. Um, punishment basically leaves somebody seeking revenge. And so we get caught up in this vicious circle as opposed to finding other ways to help them take accountability and um, deal with, with their issues, reintegrate into society in a meaningful way. Um, restorative practices, restorative justice is a very important way of doing that. You know, I know Father has, has done work in that area. It makes a big difference when we move away from punishment. Doesn't mean there are consequences for negative actions, but just strictly punishing is probably not going to change it. Um, we need to get at it in different ways. We need when a person takes personal responsibility for what they've done, they will be be open to figuring out ways that they can make changes, that they can do things differently. So that's the second question. And the third question is: Are punishment and accountability synonymous? Because people will say, well, um, you know, if you, if you don't have punishment, you know, how do you hold them accountable? Well, you can't hold anyone accountable. Only a person can hold themselves accountable. You can punish them. You can do all kinds of things to them. But that's, that's not accountability. Accountability is something that 
you take on, that you accept, that you realize that you have done something wrong and you want to change that. Um, the, um, in restorative practices, there's a, there's a phase where um, you're, maybe you're working with somebody, they've heard from people close to them about how whatever it is they did impacted them, and, and all of a sudden an offender realizes that he hurt way more people than just the one person that he thought he hurt. You know, he hurt his parents, he hurt his best friend, he hurt you know, other people close to him. Um, and there's a moment when all of a sudden, you know, you go, ooh, I really messed up there. I really did something wrong. Um, it's something that John Braithwaite, who's a criminologist out of New Zealand, um, calls uh, reintegrative shaming. Reintegrative shaming. And I don't use that term. I explain it because people run into it. Um, because in our country, when we think about shaming someone, we think about putting an A on their, uh, on their sweater. We think about putting them in the stocks and throwing cabbages at them. I mean, we, we have, we did shaming way back in the early days in this country. And so we think of shaming as something different. Um, what, but I think what Braithwaite is really talking about is that moment of personal embarrassment, that moment of personal accountability, where all of a sudden, maybe for the first time, the person, the offender is embarrassed by what they did. Um, and that may be the first time they've ever felt that. Um, that's a very, very powerful thing. You know, if you just, if, you, if that's, if all you do is punish them, it doesn't change it. It just gets, gets you looking for revenge. So, you know, something that goes along with that is I would, a question I ask people a lot is, um, you know, when do parents stop spanking their children? You know, parents who spank their children, when do they stop? You stop when the kids are big enough to fight back. So, you know, that's a power imbalance that you're using as a punishment. It's very different than, than other ways of helping correct that behavior. So, those are, th those are the three global questions. And then, um, a couple of other questions I really like that I just throw up here because I want to share them with you. First one is, how many children do you have? You know, I go around and ask you. The correct answer is, how many are there? You know, how many children are there? That's how many we have. We're responsible for all of them. You know, we should be responsible for all of them. So I I, I like to think about that question that way. That, that you know, how many do you have? I don't know how many are there. The second part of that is how many juvenile delinquents are there in the United States right now? You know, I can ask you to guess and stuff, but the correct answer is how many juveniles are there? Because nobody makes it through adolescence without doing something at some point that if they were in the, the, a different place at the wrong time, they might end up getting into the juvenile system or get into to a much more serious punishment than they end up with. You know, if you think back on, on growing up, I mean, we all did stupid stuff. And so, you know, part of what we have to do is say, how do we, how do we work together to correct when people do stupid stuff? Um, how do we find out why that, you know, why that happened? And help them accept their accountability themselves and then, and then not make those same mistakes again. So, let me move on from there and we'll start talking about, about bullying. Um, oh no, I do want to tell you one other thing, and that's um, that we are all connected. You know, so I talked about how early people really work to, um, to, to keep everybody in place. We are all connected, and, and I'm going to actually get you to move for a second, because I want to prove it to you. Um, we were, I believe, human beings were designed to work together. Uh, we are the only species that has to watch, take care of its young until they're five or six years old um, with you know, kind of constant attention. And you know, five or six years old, you probably, a child could probably survive in a room. Not many of them would survive, but they probably could. They could forage for food, they could do things. Wouldn't have a great life, but they could stay alive. Um, every other species within Days, weeks, months, you know, you're, they're, they're young, they're out. They're, they're, you know, they're out fending for themselves. They're out there. We, we do not. We, we have to provide that for that period of time. But also, um, I believe that until we learn to work together, 
we were probably some other beast's favorite dinner. Because, you know, we don't have the, the speed to outrun stuff. Um, we don't have the upper body strength to quickly climb trees to get away from something that's chasing us. Um, we don't have spines that stick out so that we can roll up in a ball and you can't bite us. Um, like a porcupine would or, or a cheater in Australia would. So we don't have that ability. And most of us don't smell bad enough to scare prey away. So, so um, it was probably we were, we were some, something else's favorite food group until we learned to cooperate, until we learned to work together. And that's what we were, we were designed to do. So I'm going to show you how that works and what, um, why we are. What I'd like you to do is to stand up. And I want to try and make a big circle with everybody. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle, but... Good. Oh, you guys are wonderful. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to bring this over here and give it to a couple of people. And, um, and then I'll come back over here. And if... Um, <coughs> let me have the two of you, if you would. Um, each holds one end of it. You hold that end and you hold the other end. Hold it with this hand. You hold it. Good. Okay, and come back. Because what we're going to do is we're all going to hold hands. And we're up and this is going to prove to you that we are all interconnected. So we've got to close in. I'll step in here. And um, actually, I'm going to have to put the mic down when I do this. But, um, Okay, now somebody let go. Okay, now hold hands again. Somebody else let go. Okay, reconnect. Now tell me we're not connected. Tell me we're not passing energy to each of us. And that we're all sharing energy. And we're all sharing, you know, we're doing that together. Tell me we're not doing that. When this thing lights up that stick and makes it make noise. Now, for those of you that don't see that, yeah, we just sit down. Yeah, thank you. For those of you that are that are interested in what this is and saying, you know, it's some kind of magic, it's actually a children's toy. It's called an energy stick and or an energy rod. You can buy them at Amazon for about nine bucks, and um, and they're fun. It's um, but it's one of the best ways I know to show people that we really truly pass energy from one person to another. Um, first time I found this. I was able, I brought it to Thanksgiving dinner with uh, my son who went to Trinity. And uh, we were out in St. Louis, he's married to a young woman out there. And it was, um, hit her family came, our family was there, um, and we had we'd all met, but we weren't all that close yet. And I brought it, and we stood at Thanksgiving and connected us all together and said, and it was really because we, we had a brand new grandbaby at that point and said, look at how we're connected. And then we were holding hands with the baby as well mm -hmm. and just passing that energy through. And just as a way of reminding us that we are connected. We, you know, we, so why do we act like we're not connected? Why do we think that we can go all the way back to, that we can dispose of some people? You know, why do we do that? That doesn't make any sense. So. Now we're going to now talk a bit about bullying, because that's what we really came for tonight. But it's all connected, and I'd like you to think about the bigger stuff with this as we get into some of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but some of the things about bullying, um, you know, about 160,000 kids a day report that they're afraid to go to school um, because of being bullied. Um, you know, that study goes back to 2005, and it hasn't changed much since then. Um, it's still still very much the same. Um, you know, the, it's been recognized as a worldwide problem. I've done work on this around the world and presented around the world. Um, I've written extensively on it. Um, did a, my, actually, my doctoral thesis looked at all of the um, state statutes on bullying around the country. And then I wrote a, a model statute, because none of the statutes work. Um, 
they were basically legislatures kind of put together stuff that already existed and labeled it an anti-voting, but it didn't it didn't address it. They they missed a lot of the points. Um, but if, part of what we have to understand as well is what bullying really is. Um, bullying is not somebody being a jerk one time. You know that they we're all capable of doing that, and and really when it happens. Hopefully somebody says, you know, that's really not appropriate, and it changes. Bullying is really, over a period of time, concentrated. It's an intention to take control, intention to be in control. Um, it's, it's designed by a person to, 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 to take, have power over that other person. And so, um, it's, if you have one time that you have a kid, you know, somebody in school and they bully another, you think they're bullying another kid because they do something. Unless they're doing that repeatedly, that's just them being a jerk for that one day. Now we need to correct that, we need to help them correct that and know that that's not the right thing to do. But sometimes we want to label kids as bullies too quick, which is not a good thing. Um, there's a theory in criminal justice called labeling theory, it's you know, put together by a guy named Lamette. And labeling theory basically says, if I tell you you are something, and I tell you enough and enough people tell you, you'll, you'll live up to the label, you'll act out the label. So if I tell you you're a bully and we keep telling you you're a bully, you're gonna say, okay, I guess I'm a bully, so now I'll be a bully. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense. We need to not, we need to be careful how we label stuff or you know, labeling people. We need to correct that in a different way. So, um, there are basically three components to, um, to bully. There's a bully or a perceived offender. There's a target, you know, somebody that, that the offender is targeting, that they're trying to control. And there's an audience, you know, we can call them bystanders. Um, and the bystanders are not only those that were there that maybe witnessed it, but bystanders are people who hear about it later on, people who have an influence back on both the target and the bully, the target or the offender. Um, you know, and of course, cyber, the cyber world, the computers just, like it did for everything else, you know, just, just moved it up to lightning speed, where it used to be that, you know, things happened, it happened in school and it took a while. You know, now it happens overnight. Um, and as other people climb in and jump in and get involved in it. So, so that audience, that audience grows, that bystander group grows. Now what you have to understand about the bystanders is very, very important. Um, but they're not a homogeneous group. The bystanders are a con they have a constellation of interests. So you have people in a bystander group who support the target. Um, you have people in a bystander group who support the bully or support the offender. Um, you have people in the group, kids in the group, grown-ups in the group, who support justice and just think this is wrong and it should be different, it shouldn't happen. So we have those that support justice. Then we have a group that really supports and loves drama. And so what they like to do is keep this going. You know, so because it's fun to watch, right? So you want to keep this going. So you've got all of these different interests. And we have to deal with all three or things don't change. If we only deal with two, it won't change. We've got to deal with all three. Um, and if we do that, it's not hard. But we just have to be mindful of that. So, so that's an important part of this. Now, um, so just some real quick stuff. Um, kids identified as bullies by the age of eight are six times more likely to become involved in criminal behavior. That was um, that work was done by a, a, a Norwegian scientist named Hobeus, who has done a lot of a lot of bullying work. A really smart guy. Um, and so. Um, and I'll show you some of those. The three, and so the three pathways to adult crime are one is an authority conflict pathway, another is a covert pathway, and the third is the overt pathway. And what these mean is the authority conflict pathway begins with stubborn behavior leading to defiance, moves from defiance to authority avoidance, to once you're running away, uh, to more serious offenses, drug abuse, and um, personality destructive actions. So the covert pathway begins with minor underhanded behavior, lying, stealing, shoplifting. Uh, from here, the property damage and the more serious crimes, pickpocketing, lots of theft, 
And then the overt pathway is escalation of aggressive acts. Begins with bullying and aggression, and from here to fighting and violence. So that fits mostly on the male side. Females, girls tend to bully more by social exclusion, um, and, and which is, you know, every, you know, it's every bit as damaging as, as, as somebody coming in and taking your lunch money. I mean, it's just, you know, so that whole social exclusion piece is very difficult as well. And we'll talk about how we get at some of that. But what happens is, if, um, you know, if you're caught up in bullying, um, you end up, you know, basically with anger, some form of anger, because, you know, somebody is doing something to you. And from that, um, you know, it's, it's internal and external, and it can result in depression or violence. So, you know, people talk a lot about it, and it's, it's true, that anger turned inward turns into depression. Ex external anger turns into some kind of outburst of violent act. But it's the same, it's coming from the same place. It's coming from that place of anger. Um, quick things about depression. Um, you know, higher levels, kids who are, have been bullied show higher levels of depression in their 20s, even though they're not being bullied as adults. Um, so the impact of, of being bullied, seriously bullied, um, can last for a long time. Um, and for some people, it lasts throughout their life. The um, boys subjected to regular bullying have been shown to be over five times more likely to be depressed than those not being bullied. And frequently bullied, bullied girls are eight times more likely to commit suicide. Um, those numbers, unfortunately, was held up in terms of the way that works and how they react to that. So, you know, the, the, the extent of it, again, we're not talking about somebody um, doing something in a classroom where, you know, they say something nasty to somebody and you know, and they, it's only, it's only if, they, if they're not, if they do it, yeah, that's being stupid and they shouldn't, but it really takes that, are they doing it every day? You know, are they picking on this kid every day? Are other kids joining into that? Um, and that happens a lot, um, because there's that there's a phenomenon, sometimes within bullying, where people will side with the bully um, as a way of protection. You know, it's almost like, you know, if I, if I, show him I'm his friend or show her I'm her friend and kind of do some of the stuff that she does, um, then she won't pick on me. And so, you know, some people do that in terms of self-protection. And, and not only for kids. Um, if any of you remember the, the problems that happened in the education school at the University of Louisville, it's a guy named Dick Feltner who was the dean who went to prison um, for mismanagement of funds. But, he purposely, when he came to the university, he, per he came there in order to defraud them. You know, it was very hard to catch somebody whose purpose when they show up is to do something illegal. You know, usually what happens is people slide into that. Um, but he came to that purpose. He knew what he was going to do. And so the way he kept people from looking at his books and looking into stuff and doing stuff was he was a classic bully. Um, and his whole purpose of bullying everybody was to keep them away, keep them from seeing stuff. And one of the problems that the Ed School had for, for a number of years, still finally getting by, getting past it, were the numbers of people who sort of sided with him when he was there for their own protection. And then all of a sudden realized either that that was a, a colleague that they had, had a long relationship with or else or all of a sudden turned on them, or they themselves had done that negative stuff towards other people. You know, university lost a lot of good people over that. But that, so the reason I'm telling you that story is just, this is not just about seven and eight year olds or 10 year olds and 12 year olds. You know, adults do the same thing, they follow the same patterns. So, uh, so we keep moving on this. Um, on the violent side, you know, virtually every school shooting, student school shootings, not, not the horrible things like that happen in Nashville where somebody comes back and, Although, you know, there may, be, there may be, as they look into that, there may have been some bullying in the background there. But in all of the other ones, those have been, been people who have severe, been severely bullied when they were young, um, or younger in school, and came back to get even. Uh, so you have things like, um, you know, the, the Jonesboro at Columbine um, in Kentucky, at Heath High School, you know, in 97. Michael Conneal, who's out at LaGrange, um, 
he was severely bullied at that school. And there was no, nobody was paying attention to this stuff. Uh, there was an article in the school paper that they had no faculty supervision over the, the school paper. There was an article in there that strongly suggested that he was gay. You know, and this again, I think Murray is in 97 where, you know, that would have been something that, that other kids would have picked up on and got on. And he, he had some real problems. And he's on medication full time now. Uh, apparently, I know some people who talk to him, he's, you know, he's pretty normal right now as long as he stays on his meds. But he, um, he couldn't make friends at his school. He would go to the mall and buy CDs back when people used CDs. And he'd bring them to school and in the original wrappers. And he'd buy them for like $15 with some of his allowance. And he'd bring them to school and he'd sell them for like five or six dollars, just trying to make a friend, just trying to get somebody to like him. Um, the group of kids that he shot were a prayer group. Um, and they met before school. Uh, and he responded to them saying, um, he was from a fairly religious Baptist family. And he said, you know, they, they wouldn't let me in their prayer group. Um, now it turned out he never asked them. You know, he never went to any of them and said, could I join you, could I be part of this? But he, he had been bullied a lot and he just assumed that they, would, they, they wouldn't let him in. And so that's, those are the people that he struck out at, um, which is really, really awful. Um, you know, that he was in that position and also that, that you know, they, they came to school one day and then didn't go, get to go home. But all of that is, is heavily connected to bullying. In Columbine, those kids were all bullied. Um, they were all kind of the outcasts. They, um, they hung out together because they were the only ones that they kind of got along. And so they decided if they were the outcasts, they'd act like outcasts. And the problem was one of the kids was a psychopath and um, you know, got the other ones into the rest of the process. So all of this has, you know, it doesn't happen to every bullying case that somebody does this, but all of this has the ability to, to have long-term ramifications. So it's important that we continue to work on it. Um, again, you know, the violence you know, worldwide has just been part of it. Now, what we're seeing more and more of now um, is cyberbullying. And you know, and it's kind of metastasized into cyber, cyber bullying. Um, and by that I mean, um, if something new comes out, like, you know, like everybody right now is talking about TikTok, but if in the next couple of weeks somebody releases something else out there, a new, a new app, a new, new thing, um, the kids will be using that to bully before we even know it exists. Because that's so much in the world, there's so much on top of all of that, that they're already going to be using it before we know that it's out there. So that puts us in a situation where um, the, um, you, know, we'll, we'll, you know, and I'll come back to what we can do about all this. I'm looking for a, um, a slide in here that I want to show you that, okay, the students want to tell us. They really do want to tell us. But the problem is they think we already know. Um, they think we already that, that that teachers know everything, that they can see that, um, and they wrongfully assume that. Um, and then oftentimes we don't have a safe way for them to tell us. So if something's happening to them, they don't feel comfortable telling them. Um, you know, I've been in lots of schools where people will say, "Well, if something you know something like this happens, just come down and tell the assistant principal." Um, you know, because assistant principal is in charge of all this. Well. Unfortunately, you know, assistant principal is, 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 in, is in charge of all of that. And going down to the office to tell them that as, a, as a kid, that's not safe. That's not a safe way for me to tell you anything. Actually, if I walk into that office, there are probably four or five kids sitting outside the, the, the office waiting to get yelled at. And, and one or two of them may be the kids who are giving me a hard time. So I'm not going to go down there and do that. Or if you have some kind of anonymous box that people are going to see me putting the, the note in the anonymous box. You know, it's a, because when it's happening to you, the, the level of paranoia is up high. So it's very hard to do that. We need ways for them to let us know. I can show you a couple, but because I did some work with the archdiocese and stuff to, to try to test and improve it. But they want to tell us, and they think we know. Um, I'll tell you a story about that. It was at a school 
that um, had, it was, it was actually a, it was a, a Catholic school, um, and they had one of the eight, some of the eighth graders um, had cre created a picture of a student doing something of seeing the cat and passed the picture around you know, when they were sending it to each other. Um, and so every time the kids would see this, the kid in the hallway that was on the picture, um, it was all manipulated. They would all go meow, and they'd all laugh, and they all thought it was funny. Um, and that went on. Um, but unfortunately, uh, and this actually was a diocese school here in, in, in Louisville, because I'll tell you the reason why people thought that the teachers knew. Um, these were eighth graders, and they were, um, he was actually going to go to St. Eric's. Um, and so, you know, because it's one of the traditional schools. I, I, I coached at Trinity and I, I serve on one of their boards. Um, you know, so we, and I know a lot about what goes on there. Of course, you know, we, if, you know, we kid, kid back and forth, but we really care about each other. But, you know, the, the teachers th knew he was, this kid was going to, the same X, and if you okay, these are the, the kids going to Trinity that are calling him a kitty cat because he's going to go up and be a tiger. So he'll be, you know, because we'll, we'll refer to them as the kitty cat sometimes. Um, you know, just like, you know, they'll tell us that we're dumb as rocks. Um, and so, so that was the point. So, so they would sometimes, when they would do the meow, some of the teachers in the school just assumed that they didn't see the pain in this kid's face. They just assumed that. They, they were teasing him about going to say next, which is you know, which is good, good fun teasing. So, so that went on. It went on for five or six weeks, and it kind of spread to its younger, a uh, younger brother, younger sister, um, and until the, the kid who was they were doing this to had a nervous breakdown. I mean, literally legitimate nervous breakdown, um, and was in treatment. And the parents had had gone to school with the parents of the kids that were. Had, had were doing all of this, and they, they all thought it was just funny, but uh, but the parents, well, I just said, so the parents felt totally betrayed. I mean, they'd grown up in that parish, they'd gone to school in there. So the result of that was, besides this kid being in treatment, plus his younger brother and sister, um, the father got himself transferred out of Louisville, had a lifelong rule of agents. Had this able and his company to get transferred out of Louisville. So uh, they obviously left the parish, left the community, and were gone. Because we didn't see it. It wasn't seen there. There wasn't a way that somebody could tell them. So when there was a debriefing in the school over there, and it was it was done by a wonderful guy named Dr. Tom Robbins, Rob, Tom Roberts, and um, and Tom and I did, did a lot of work on on bullying together. Um, and Tom did uh, work in the diocese. He really went into old crisis situations and he dealt with that. PhD at Florida State. Um, he's somewhere in the Carolinas now, I think. But um, when he met with all the kids, they, uh, and asked them, "Why, you know, what happened here?" And they they told them that story. They said, "Well, we thought the teachers knew. We thought they thought it was funny too. We thought it was okay." And you know, and, and some of the kids said, "You know, I thought it was pretty disgusting, but it seemed like everybody else was laughing. So there wasn't anybody to complain to, but anybody to tell, you know." And that's that's that whole not having some way to let people know what's really going on and, and not having a way to know that. But that happens in life in lots of things. That happens in the workplace. You know, a lot of times in the workplace, if you finally say to your employees, um, is there, if there's anything here that would make things work better for our customers, um, make it be better, make it work better, make it more functional, um, please tell us and we'll, we'll do our best to do it. It's amazing, all of a sudden, a bunch of things will come in. And they'll say, well, if we did this, and you know, if we changed the door this way or that way, it'd be a lot easier for people. Um, you know, and, and, and you're always amazed, at, you know, the manager's always amazed when that happens. And if you ask them, why did you never tell me this before? And it's like, you never asked. You know, there wasn't a way to tell you. We, did, we figured you wanted it that way. So, you know, that, so we, didn't, we didn't challenge it. So that's, that's part of this. Within this, so that needs to be dealt with as well. Um, I want to show you something here. We'll take a second on this, but this is really 
kind of gets a bit to the underlying things that are going on. I told you we would do this. Um, and that's basically to, to say that there, there are kind of seven states of each of our being. You know, seven things that kind of control who we are and what we do. You know, the first one is our mental state, it's our measure of stability, our intelligence, our competency. The second is our emotional state of being, you know, our emotional orientation, our emotional control, you know, how control are we, how in control of our emotions are we? Um, the third one is a physical state of being. You know, what's our health? What's our mobility? You know, where are we physically and stuff? That's, that has a lot to do with where we are. Um, the fourth is a transpersonal state of being, kind of how we see others, how we perceive they see us. That's kind of, a, you know, a lot of times thought about as emotional intelligence, um, but just kind of under, you know, that sense of understanding. Um, there's an ethical state of being, which is, you know, personal ethics. Um, there's also kind of spiritual intelligence, which it doesn't mean spiritual in terms of religious spiritual, but spiritual in terms of understanding um, what's important to you and that, that other people have things that are important to them and they're not, they're not all the same, kind of understanding that. And then there's a historical inherited state of being, and that ranges from a sense of entitlement. You know, if you're born, you know, very rich, you know, you may, you may grow up thinking you're entitled to this as opposed to that you just got lucky. Um, and um, to, or to, to one of being repressed and discriminated against. So it includes levels of wealth, heritage traits, and learned inherited uh, prejudice and hatred. <coughs> so why is this important? Well, the amount of positive control one has over the seven states, over each of those, um, has a lot to do with, with their stability. And when, when you don't have positive control uh, or stability, there's a tendency to compensate for that with negative activity. You know, because you're basically, if you think about it, you're basically medicating yourself for something you don't have full control over. So if, if you've got one or two of those out of balance, you, you, the tendency is to do something negative because it takes a lot of time to think about how do you do something positive. Um, and so, you know, so then you, so you have people who lash out. Um, well, they lash out because they don't really have control over one of those states. Um, nobody's helping them find a way to have control, you know, because it's power. We need power to survive as human beings. So if this, you know, if you're using negative power, how can I help you get positive power? You know, how can I do that as opposed to, um, you know, just going forward with with negative power? So bullying, oftentimes, fits right into this that somebody that has, has an issue in one of those seven states has learned over time that by bullying, they can medicate themselves for what that underlying problem is for them. And that they need to, we need to find a way to help them with that. So, um, since I talk in stories, I'll tell you a story um, about dealing with, with a young person doing this. Um, I was in Belize um, back in, 2013, 2014, and I had been asked to come down and train a group of teachers in Belize about bullying. Um, and these were, we were up, um, in, basically up in the mountains, and these were primarily Mayan children that were there. Uh, it's a Mayan school, um, you know, very poor, um, and, but they had, you know, great, you know, good, good school, and, and they were just trying to figure out how to deal with bullying. So they were gonna bring all the faculty in, for me to meet with that day for a day. Um, and when I when I got there, I met the principal, and the principal told me right away, he said, I want to take you back to meet the faculty, maybe in, in an hour. I've got them scheduled for an hour from now. He said, but I've got a problem in one of my classes, and I wish I could, could I just get you to come take a look and see if there's anything you can do. So you know, I, I know this is a test. You know, the man's never met me before. He wants to see, do I know, do I know what I'm doing? You know, before he turns me loose on his faculty. Um, so that was fun. So I went to the class, and um, these were all kids that were probably 11 and 12 years old, about 25 of them, all sitting in the rows, much like a class we would see here, all sitting in those horrible little chairs that have the desk that's built in in front of you that when you get to be an adult, you can't fit in it. Um, and they're all sitting in those, and I introduced myself to the kids, and 
So we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about a few things. And, um, and I'm kind of watching them for a second, and I get them ready to kind of work on a little exercise that I have. And, and I'm watching the interplay between them. And there's a kid sitting front row, right, right over here. Um, and he's making eye contact back and forth with a kid who's sitting over here, but two seats in, and a kid sitting on the other side. And it's, and I mean, it's really obvious, you know. And now I know this kid didn't choose that seat. You know, you're not gonna, you don't go in there um, and take a front row right there, right by the door. He was, a, he was a little bit bigger than the other kids. So right away I know this is, this is the kid who's the, the bully in this class. Um, this is who they want me to see. So, so I said, okay, so let's see what we can do. So I'm watching this, so I got the other group working on something. So, they, and, and it was a teacher there, so she could make sure that they would they'd be working on it. And I went over and um, stood in front of this desk for a minute, and I knew he's used to adults coming over and, and telling him. Um, so what I did is I went over and I got down on one knee um, and leaned into his desk so our faces were about this far apart. Now he's already confused as to why I'm doing this. Because um, I'm not yelling at him and I'm not telling him I'm gonna punish him. And, and um, So I looked at him and I said, you're a pretty tough guy, huh? And all of a sudden his eyes widened and so, cause that's, you know, if somebody says that to you in a bar, you're gonna end up fighting them. Um, so, you know, so I said, you're a pretty tough guy, huh? And he, and he looked at me and he said, uh, yes. You know, waiting for what's gonna happen next. And I said, yeah, I thought so. I said, you look like you can take care of yourself. I said, listen, I bet that if somebody came in this classroom to hurt the other kids in this room, that you and your buddy over there in the third row and your buddy at by the window, that the three of you could shut it down, that you could take care of these kids and protect them. You know, I, I, I bet you could. And he looked at me and he was like, you know, yeah, I could. And I said, okay, but would you? So there's a difference between being able to do it and actually doing it. Would you do it if somebody were gonna bother you, hurt them? He said, yeah, I would do that. I said, that's great, I knew you could. I knew you. You look like a good kid. So, so I said, but there's something that you have, we have to deal with now. I said, that you can't be their protector and their tormentor at the same time. You can't bully them and protect them at the same time. You've got to choose one or the other. But I, I guarantee you, if you choose protector um, and look out for the other kids in this class, you're going to, have, you're going to make some lifelong friends. And you're going to be their hero. And they're gonna really love you for that. But that's your choice. You gotta decide. Because I, I can't decide that for you. But you have you have a tremendous opportunity to do that if you want to do it. He said, oh, I, I want it, I want to do it. And I said, and we, now we're whispering, because everybody else's buddies are trying to figure out what's going on. So I told him, I said, now listen, I'm gonna be here all week. And, and I gave him a fist bump and I said, every time I see you, I'm gonna ask you, are you are you protecting or bullying? You know, which would you do? Because you have to. To, to, to do this, and I'll tell you what I was doing. I was taking the negative power he was using for, for controlling one of his issues and turned it into positive power where he's using the same stuff, but he's doing it in a different way. And he's getting, he's getting accolades for it. But you have to keep reinforcing it or they, or they, they drift back. So I explained it all to his teacher, um, told him what I was doing, and I said, no, I need you every time you see him looking out for other kids. I want you to, to thank him and tell him how proud of him you are. You know, and after, after he does it like two or three times, tell him, you know, you're really, you know, really happy how much he has changed. That in the past you, you were upset with him over stuff, that's all gone, I've forgotten all of that. Now you're being, you're being wonderful and I'm really, I'm really you know, happy you're supporting everyone. So, um, so I went back and I was talking to the principal for a minute and, um, and he said, how do you go? And so I, I you know, told him a little about that. And he said, yeah, he said, I already heard from the teacher. He said, that was remarkable. And I said, no, not really. He said, he just, he just needed to redirect that, the, the, what he was doing. He needed to, he's medicating for an issue. And he needed to just redirect it into something positive rather than negative, and that would help him. So I said, let me ask you some questions. I said, do you know the family? He said, oh, yeah. So I know them well. I said, okay. Does he have a domineering father? He said, oh, yeah. 
said, um, okay, is he, is he the youngest child? Does he have big brothers, big sister? I said, yeah, he's got two brothers and a big sister. I said, okay. I said, now I understand what's going on. I said, this is the only place he gets to be in charge. This is the only place that he's not being told what to do, that he's not being bullied, that he's not being pushed around. You know, because his father's pushing him around, his, brother, his brothers are pushing him around, his sister's pushing him around. This is the only place that he can exercise any power. He can do anything. Um, and, and so all they could do to, to do that was to hit kids or do something to push them or do other things to them. So now we've given him something that he can do and feel very powerful for and feel very good about it. And this will change him. I said, if you guys, if you'll keep reinforcing that, he'll make it, he'll be okay. Now I've done some things with like with teenage girls who get into social exclusion and you know work through some restorative justice with them and then work with them and say, you know, like one on one. And if you remember with working with one young lady saying, you know, I just need to tell you you have remarkable leadership skills. Now this is a kid who's thinking I'm gonna yell at her. You know, telling her, you have remarkable leadership skills. And she can you know, and I said, No, really, any fifteen year old girl who can get ten other fifteen year old girls to consistently do the same thing at the same time, in the same way, has amazing leadership skills. So, but the way you're using them right now, um, you're really hurting people. You're hurting yourself, you're hurting other people, you're hurting your family. Let's work on something different. And we ended up actually working with her organizing a group, including the ones that she excluded, um, to, to go over and read to elementary school kids who are in a building next door to the, where the high school was. And, and they organized this whole group to go over and help teach reading at the school, and help kids get up to reading. And I, and I did the same thing with the teachers. And I told them what we were doing, and that she, that she was gonna organize this, and that they had to keep reinforcing that what she was doing was really special, because that's what she needed. She needed, she needed to be told regularly that she was special, because she wasn't getting that for some reason somewhere. She just needed that. Um, once she had that, her behavior totally changed. And her group of followers changed right along with her and, and all started cooperating and helping. So you can do stuff, you can do that. That's why I wanted you to see them, you know, the, the kind of seven states of being, because it makes such a difference. Um, and um, so the other way about this, and I'm gonna stop in a second so you can ask some questions, but you know, to help them to work on this, what we really need is, and hopefully, you know, Holy Trinity has this, if not, then we should be thinking towards this. Um, but we need three things. First is we need stakeholder knowledge. We need everybody involved in a, in a school family, um, whether you know teachers, parents, uh, janitors, um, everybody involved to understand about bullying, uh, to know what it is, to know what it's not, um, and to be, be able to, to understand how we can do things differently, what we can do. Um, we need to be careful in how we, as still as part of number one, from the stakeholder knowledge. It's important that stakeholders know that it's as dangerous to not um, deal with bullying as it is to deal with it the wrong way. So if you have, and I don't know, I don't think the policies that were here, but, but if you have a zero tolerance policy, you're asking for kids to die. Um, that, that zero tolerance policies are absolutely deadly. And I, there isn't enough time for me to tell you enough stories about that, about kids who got caught up in that and went home and committed suicide. Mm -hmm. um, because they, they got expelled for the one time that they did something wrong. So if you have one, I would suggest you get rid of it. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not in charge here at school. I would suggest you get rid of it. Um, but having everybody know what it is, what it can do, what happens if you don't treat it, what happens if you treat it the wrong way, those are important things for everybody to know and that stakeholder knowledge. Um, we, then we have to have safe ways to report to an adult. Um, with the diocese back in 08, we developed an online reporting system that kids could, or parents or, or coaches or other people could report incidents that went to a person who was trained to deal with it. Um, if the kid, and they got it instantly and they could deal with it right away. Um, and also there was a set of kindness surveys that went with it so we could measure anonymously measure how kind um, we, we are being to each other. Um, the, um, actually right now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Ireland is 
using the kindness surveys with all of their congregations throughout Ireland, um, just for them to generate out in information that they can have discussions about, that they can talk about as to why would you think this is, is mean or why is this a problem? Um, so they're using that. So that's a second kind of thing. Um, and then the third is a positive way to correct the behavior. The behavior. And, and I would suggest, you know, and, and Father has done a lot of work in this area, that we really focus heavily in that whole kind of restorative justice, restorative practices way of resolving stuff. So it's not just simply we're going to punish you for this, but we, we try and figure out, like I did with the little boy in Belize, to figure out why is this happening? You know, that's the problem. You know, the bullying by him was the symptom for coming from that problem. Um, and, you know, and when I talk about that as a, as a symptom, um, you know, if we took a kid and said to the kid, listen, um, you've been bullying other children here, and we're upset about that, but if, um, if, you, if you don't bully another kid for the rest of the school year, on the last day of school, I'm going to give you $10,000 in cash. Um, well, there's a really good chance that kid's not going to bully anybody for the rest of the year. But did we correct the behavior? All we did was correct one of the symptoms. There's a good chance within that that either now or when he gets his cash, he's, he's going to experiment with drugs or he's going to experiment with, 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 with tobacco or he's going to lie or he's going to cheat or he's going to take one of those other things because he still has to medicate that underlying problem. He still has to deal with it. And, and so the fact that I cover up that one symptom by, by paying him off doesn't change he has other, he has, still has needs and that this other symptoms are going, to, are going to come up in another way. So it's important to understand it, understand it that way, because that's the only way to really correct this. Now, sometimes I'll hear um, from people will say to me, we don't have time to do all of that. And I'll say, yeah, but you do have time to deal with the same, same kids, same circumstances over and over and over again, you know? Try it. Try, you know, if you can, if you can change a couple, um, that'll move it on. And if you, and it's, and, and again, as, as we have the bystanders that are watching all of this, um, they see what's going on. You know, that class in Belize saw this kid transform. You know, all of a sudden, they were real interested in that, and they were really interested in, in, in maybe why he was doing what he was doing before, but why he's, what he's doing now. You know, it's, it's transformative for them. Um, they, they, they do want to tell us, they do want things to go right in their classrooms, in their relationships, but, you know, it's life, and things happen. And if we, if we treat it correctly, we can make it better. If we treat it incorrectly, it just gets worse. So with that, let me stop and see if there's some questions I can answer, because I, you know, we're, we're coming up at 8 o'clock, and I don't, I'll stay as long as anybody <laughs> wants to stay, but I, but, uh, but I also will not be offended as soon as it hits 8 o'clock for all of us who are going to go out the door. Are there any questions I can answer? I have a question. Sure. Have a question. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of parents seem um, reluctant also to report, um, maybe to people in the school or whatever, um, about bullying because they're so worried that will have negative effects on their child as well. Do you have recommendations for parents how to report, or do you give your child tools? Or Yeah, you, you need a system for that. I mean, they need to know what's safe, and they need to know what's going to happen when they do that so that they're not imagining stuff. You know, one of the biggest problems we have in life is we all make assumptions about stuff. You know, when I do mediations, the problem with mediation is usually the parties in conflict have both made wrongful assumptions about the other. You know, and, and you know, that doesn't make sense, but we do it. We do that all the time. I actually realized, and I tell all my classes this, that one day I realized that 85% of the assumptions I have are incorrect. 85%. Now, that's an assumption too, because it could be 100% incorrect. It could be 90, it could be 75, I don't know. But what I learned from that was that what I needed to do was I had to test an assumption before I acted upon it. And it changed how I did a lot of stuff. That if I have an assumption that you know, so if a parent has an assumption that this, the child's going to get in trouble or there's going to be an issue with the school, they need to come test that. They need to come talk to somebody and say, or come see father and say, you know, if, you know, I'm having an issue, I don't want to tell you about it yet because I'm worried about it, could happen, this could happen, that. They're going to find out that assumption was incorrect, that no, people really want to know and they really do want to work with you. But we, we make that mistake all the time about assumptions. 
It changed the way I taught, by the way. You know, because now, if I have a student that I haven't seen for a couple of weeks and they haven't turned in work in, um, you know, usually professors, you know, start to dish out the punishment. But what I do now is I reach out to the student right away. Um, and I'll say, you know, hey, I've seen you for a couple of weeks and you missed an assignment. Is there something wrong, something happening in your life, something going wrong for you? Is there something I can do to help you? How can I help you get back on track? I know you were a good student or want to be a good student. How can I help you? And it's amazing the reactions I've gotten since then. But before, it was just about I'll give this kid a C. Um, what I get back is I hear back from kids from, that all of a sudden get very honest. And some of them will say, you know, you know, Professor, I've just been having a tough semester and I've been letting stuff go and I don't know why, but it's just not working for me. And, and I can reach back to them and say, well, why don't you come see me? Let me help you. Let's see if we can figure this out together. Let's get you to where you want to be. You know, I tell them, hey, I'm in the moving company. You know, moving business. My job is to get you from where you are now to where you want to go. So, you know, come see me and we'll talk about this and I'll see if we can help you move through that. Um, you know, others will, will come back and just say, you know, well, you know, um, I've, I've been really sick for the last week and I can get your doctor's note, but I, you know, but just thank you so much for reaching out to me. You know, my assumption before would have been, this is a kid who doesn't care. Only to find out that they do care, but sometimes the problem is, if they let it go on for a while, um, then you get so afraid to tell the professor or to go to class or to do stuff that you won't, you won't, you won't do anything. And it just keeps getting worse because then the longer you wait, the worse it gets. So I found that rather than make the assumption that this kid's not doing the work, that I should, I need to reach out to him, I need to talk to him. Yes, sir. What I've gathered here this evening <clears throat> is that your main concern is with the bully themselves, not the children who have been bullied. That um, is my that is why I came tonight. Mm -hmm. Now one other thing, sure. if I may. Oh absolutely, please. You talked about number two, safe ways to report to a trained adult. Mm -hmm. Now we were in a situation with a young family member and they said to him, uh, well you let us know anytime so and so does something wrong and he said well I don't want to I don't want to be a snitch a snitch and they said well you can you can let us know off to the side now what ended up happening is when he reported the the bullying and who the bully uh, bully was all of a sudden you saw someone at the door come in and say William and Jack, principal's office. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's not a trained adult. No, it's not. No. And that's, that's as you know, and I have great concern for the kids that have been targeted. Well, it, it shut him down. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It shut him down. And he wasn't going to tell anybody anything. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. Except his therapist. Right. And what happens with that is, um, you know, I, I, I talk to them as, and I tell them that they're a target. They're not a victim, they're a target. You happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when somebody else's life issue ended up on you. And one of the examples I use a lot for kids is I say, you know, think about if you were walking through the mall and all of a sudden one of the chandeliers fell and hit you and knocked you on the floor. Do you really think that chandelier had been waiting for 25 years for you to be walking by to fall on you? It's like, no, it's an accident. It's like, okay, being a target oftentimes is an accident. Now that's not to forgive that and that's not, you know, it's just unfortunately you're in the wrong place at the wrong time this happened. It's that whoever is doing this to you or the group that's doing this to you is living out a different life trauma that they need to do. But let's move you forward. Let's work on that. The reason you do that, you get up to that point, is people who have been targeted end up doing what I, get, I call getting caught in the why. And getting caught in the why is where you say, why does this happen to me? Why does this always happen to me? Why am I the one that everybody picks on? You know, why, 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 why? And the problem is when you do that, when you get caught in that loop, you're going round and round and round, and there's no answer to that. And so when you have somebody who's caught in the why, you know, I explain to kids when I'm, when I'm talking about that, and they go, yeah, I had to kind of do that. I say, yeah, go down to the hall, go in the bathroom, flush the toilet, and watch the water go round and round and round and round in the bowl and then down the drain. So because that's what you're doing to yourself. So now let's figure out how we break that cycle. You know, and, and you break 
disciple by talking about what did they want to do before? Where do they want to go? What do they want to do next? And how are they going to get there? And then you move into something that people call, um, comes from a, a psychologist called William Glasser. It's called um, reality therapy. And basically what happens is you talk about that new goal and you, lay, and you lay a plan out together. You get the kid to lay the plan out about these are the steps I have to do to do this. And then you, you, you work on taking one small step each day and moving that. And you get parents to reinforce that, other people close to them to reinforce that, and it works. Um, it helps you move forward. Because until you can do that, to, until you can stop looking at the circle going around of why does this happen to me, you can't, you can't go forward. You're stuck in that. You're stuck in a lot. Um, bullies tend to get stuck in a lot. You know, we call them a bully. We tell them they're bully. Um, we have to get them into a different place to where they have to understand why they do this. Why do they make these bad choices? Um, and we can then help them figure out a better way, again, using reality therapy, to make better choices going forward once they really, once they want to. So I don't, I, I don't know if that helps, but that's, but we can, but. The worst thing we can do for somebody is a target. The worst thing we can do is promise you it's not going to happen again. Because somebody who's, who's being bullied, and there's an intervention, and if it's not handled correctly, that kid will be re-bullied by the bully again within a couple of weeks of, of the reporting. And if, and if not by the bully, it'll be, it'll be by somebody close to the group, by the group. Um, and so, you know, to tell a kid, you know, this shouldn't be happening. We don't approve of this. Um, we're not going to let it happen again. Uh, it's, it's not going to happen. No, if you, and if you couple that, if, if the parents of that child um, or an older brother or older sister kind of have the uh, Christmas story version of bullying, which is it won't stop until you fight back. Um, you know, and so if, if they have, if you have somebody telling them that, <clears throat> you promise the kid it's not going to happen again happens again. Um, they go home and they tell their dad, you know, they said it wasn't going to happen again, it happened again. And if the father then says, well, you know, you got to have to fight back. Why don't you, why don't you fight him back? you got to fight him back. If you don't fight him back, it's going to keep happening. What's wrong with you for not fighting him back? Um, and the school says to him, and he, and he, tells, so he tells the school, he said, you know, my dad said I've got to hit this kid if I, or, or fight back or it's going to keep happening. And the school says, if you do that, then we're going to suspend you. Well, now we got this kid and we're bullying him in three different places. The bullies are bullying the kid, the parents are bullying the kid, and the school is bullying the kid. So no wonder they get really depressed. No wonder they have trouble functioning. Because um, they're getting it from everybody. And you know, they're at an age where they, they're they not developed enough to be able to say, this is crap, I'm not gonna listen to anybody. You know, I'm just gonna move on myself. They won't, I mean, they, they stop believing. Yes, so what are, the, what are the plans, so if you're gonna have this child who's being bullied, and you go, okay, we're gonna have a plan, and we're gonna work on it. What specific, what do you tell them? What, what is the plan? Oh, it's, it's really to help them get to what they wanna do. Sometimes it could be. Yeah, so give me some examples. I don't know what you mean. Oh, sure, no. Where they no, it could be, you know, you know what, some of, the, what so, some of their dreams are, things they wanna do, but, you know, do you play an instrument? Do you play a sport? Do you, you know, um, what's something that they're interested in? And how can we how can we double down on doing that? How can we help you um, do that better? What do you need to do that? You know, um, so it it's finding something that that's that's important to them that we can help them move forward with something they care about. It could be this their little dog at home. But so it doesn't really help them find a bully except their own emotional. State. It helps their own emotional state. We we got to be treating all three of those groups. But I have a question too. The effectiveness of um, this positive reinforcement with these kids. I have seen over and over again the abuse of domineering parents who have these high demands on these kids and the parents that literally are not present at all. They're too involved in their own social life and these kids are allowed to just grow up. How effective is it to work with these kids just in the school setting when they go home every night and then deal with an aggressive parent, a parent that's not there when they're on their mm -hmm. own taking care of themselves. I mean, because that's a big issue. Oh, it's a huge issue. So I don't know how, you know, you can try to do do work here, but when they, you know, it's like a kid that, that has struggles with their academics. Mm -hmm. You can do what you want in the classroom, but if you go home and the parent doesn't sit there and 
try to work with you and help you with your homework and your patience, the kid's not going to be very successful. So what do you do when these kids have problems where the parents are just too into themselves or they've got a really dominating and hurting parent that, that it's not working with them? You know, in, in some ways, I mean, this is not a good answer to that. It, you do the best you can because <clears throat> it's sometimes you can correct it. Sometimes you can talk to the parent about it. Sometimes you can't. Um, I was a, I'm, I'm a level five ice hockey coach, which is the highest level you can be as a coach. Coach for years and years. Those of you who know Mary Jean, Jean and Balcala, coached her son Matt all the way growing up. And um, in fact, I had Matt wanting to come to Trinity. And Joe Gandolfo, you know, I said, um, I mean, everybody in, the, in that family all went to St. Mary's. And, uh, and you know, Joe told him, he said, you can go to Trinity with Coach Burton if you want. I said, but I don't know who's going to pay you tuition. <laughs> so, but, uh, but anyway, good kid. But in, in, when all of the coaching I've done, I've never had a kid who was a problem, but I didn't meet the parents who know exactly where the problem was coming from. I mean, every time, you know, every kid I ever had that was a problem. Um, sometimes I was able to talk to the parent um, and get them to change, get them to, to back off and let, you know, let, let this kid develop. Sometimes you can't. So all you can do is the best you can do. But I wasn't going to punish the kid for it. I was going to do everything I could to try and help the kid. You know, I could not, if that little kid in Belize, I couldn't have gone and tell his father to back off him or his brother or sister to back off. They wouldn't have done that. All I could do was give him something he could do to feel good about himself and help. Um, so some of it is you, you just have to do the best you can. But that also kind of fits way back in the beginning when I asked you how many children you have. You know, it's like, because we're all responsible for raising them. So maybe we can help intervene with that kid in a different way. You know, even academically sometimes, if the parents aren't helping, um, maybe what we need to do is reach over to Trinity and talk to a couple of people there, see if some of the kids that are the service projects that they, they need to do would be willing to come over and work with some little two or three of the kids here that aren't getting that support from home. You know, because there are some pretty smart kids over there, and St. Mary's kids would do the same, and so would, would Assumption and Sacred Heart and Holy Cross, and, you know, they, so, you know, sometimes if, we, if they're not getting it from the parents, maybe we can help them get some of it from somebody else. But we won't get any of it if we don't, if we don't figure out what's going on and take the time to, to be with them and listen to them. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So for our school, um, pre-K through eighth grade, mm -hmm. approximately 75 to 90 kids per grade, what would you envision um, for the trained adults? Like you could give an example of you coming in and, and doing these interventions. Mm -hmm. Is it training each teacher to, or is it training a specific admins person on the administration, or is it um, finding someone from outside of the school to be a consultant on an as needed basis, or is it come in and, and be here on a, a full-time basis to help work through some of these issues? Yeah, I think the best way, you know, first off is, is get all of the teachers to have that stakeholder knowledge. But everybody else, cafeteria workers, everybody, because they all see what's going on. They need to understand that. And then we need somebody who, um, basically a guidance counselor or somebody who has has done some, some psychological work, who understands this, who understands how to do that and have that be one or two of those people be the ones who are really doing the intervention work. So a report would go to them and be very, very secret, you know, would be, be very confidential and nobody else would see it, um, but then they can document everything we work on it and they'd be the point person in that. And do you need a guidance counselor who has been trained in bullying, or is that something that anyone can be trained in, like at, at this point, if that's not your background? Oh, sure. No, that, that training could happen in a couple of days. To get them through it, get them in, get them some restorative justice training. You know, it's, it's, they've already had some of it. It just has to, somebody has to point it out to them and show them exactly how you do it and some of the things you can say, how to do that, how to help the kid. Um, how to make them feel safe and secure. Um, you know, because again, you know, saying to them like the gentleman saw up here, telling them, you know, you tell us the next time these kids do this, um, that's not safe reporting. You know, I mean, you, you as a kid, you know that's not safe. I go, I go tell somebody there and they come in and they, they tell, you know, they come in and they grab those kids and drag them out. You know, you know I'm gonna get my butt kicked on the way home from school tonight. That's, you know, that's what's gonna happen to me. You know, so you're not gonna tell them. 
and that keeps them from being able to report to an incumbent. So you've got to have a better way to do that. We also have to have discussions in the classrooms about stuff. That's why the, the kind of stuff that we use um, is um, basically, we use it about every six to eight weeks in a classroom, and it's all anonymous. Kids go on a computer in a, in a, in a media class, and they answer um, like four or five questions. The first question is they just tell us which class they're in, if they're a boy or a girl. Um, and then the, um, the next question is, on a scale of one to five, how are we treating each other? So you're getting a subjective thing, and it's all anonymous, so I don't know which kid is reporting this. But we're getting a look in the classroom of how we think we're treating each other in this classroom. And, and I'm going to come back six weeks later, and we're going to look at that again, and we're going to be able to start comparing. We're getting better, we're getting worse. But I've got to think about kindness now. So the next question asks, have you seen any, any acts of kindness from anybody in your class that you think other people should know about? Um, and so they'll tell us. And of course, the little guys, you know, their, their kindness is, you know, I dropped my pencil and somebody picked it up for me. <clears throat> but you got the seven, sixth, seventh, eighth graders, and they're a bit more sophisticated in what they'll come back with and what they talk about. Then the next question asks acts of meanness. Um, and then there's a place where it says, if you need to report bullying, click over here. And that goes to an incident report that, that's very, that's the kind of reporting that, that's very private and goes to the person who can intervene. But mostly it's, it's asking, what, what do they consider mean? Um, and it's all about having discussions. So, oh, and the third question is anything electronic or in the cyber world by anybody in the group that you think is inappropriate. If, if that had been in place when the cat picture was going around, some, you know, that would have shown up right away. So what it's for is it comes out, prints out for each classroom teacher or, or for counselor, um, and they take that into a class and they, they have a discussion about it. You know, they'll say, hey, we're gonna tell you about, uh, you know, so-and-so has done this wonderful thing. You know, we don't know if you know about that. And they talk about this kind thing. You know, and, and you know, if the kid wants them to talk about it. If not, they say, you know, Whoever, the person who did this um, wants to stay anonymous, but don't you like to know that somebody in your class is doing this wonderful stuff outside of it? Um, then, you know, you talk about the mean stuff. What do you mean by this? What does that mean? Why, why does that mean? You know, but, like, you know, um, what do you think, you know, calling each other names is mean? You know, say, okay, why does that mean? You know, let's talk about that. So they're having a conversation about this, and they're trying to, they're trying to be better. Um, that can help a lot. Is that something that is out in the world accessible to mm -hmm. anyone who wants to use it? Oh, no. Yeah, it's, 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 um, and, and um, again, it was tested in some of the diocese schools. Um, we had an interesting case. One of the schools that tested it was St. Bonnet's uh, over at GD. And then I got a call from the counselor after they'd had it for four or five months saying that she had a fourth grade class that had made a really good jump in in their kindness. And um, so she went to the counselor said, so I went down with the teacher and we talked to him about what it was. And said, and it took a while to get the kids to talk because they're always nice. So when they started finally talking, one of the kids said, well, we were trying to figure out, I said, a lot of times we, we call each other names because we're kidding each other. We're trying to be funny, right? So we tried to figure it out, but then we realized sometimes that's really hurtful. So we tried, we, we as a group, we were trying to figure out how can we do this and have it be funny and have everybody know it's funny. So we couldn't figure it out. We couldn't figure out a way to do that that wouldn't, that somebody wouldn't take and be, be hurt by it. So they said, so we decided that we just weren't gonna call each other names anymore. Said, and, and the whole class decided this, that they wouldn't call each other names. And they said, and if, if anybody, if you hear somebody calling somebody a name, be minded we don't do that anymore. Um, and this is what this class had done. They did it on their own. And, and she and I were talking about that. We said, we couldn't have paid them to do that. We couldn't have beaten them to do that. You know, we could tell them to do that. There's no, they had to decide themselves. That's how they wanted to work together. And they were trying to just make it fun to them. So that's what they did. Um, you know, and I mean, that's my favorite story about, about how we can make a change. Now again, we use it with, um, you know, the Adventists are using it with congregations right now. They're finding, you know, that a lot of times when, it's, when a church is split, it's because, you know, people start making assumptions about other people. Um, and, you know, one of the assumptions that happens is um, you'll have people who um, 
like to go into, I like to do is go into the sanctuary early, um, listen to a prelude if there, listen to the music, relax, um, think about where I am, try and get in the presence of the room I'm in. Um, I, I like to, you know, look at a hymnal, I like to you know, look at the Bible, you know, and just reflect, and I, and I enjoy doing that. Um, and there, there are a lot of people who come into service and do that, will come and do that. Um, but you'll have people who say, yeah, but when I'm doing that, then these other people come in, and they're talking, they're greeting everybody, and, you know, and they make a lot of noise, and it just disturbs me. It takes away from, from the, the sanctity of the, of the sanctuary. Um, and so those, those groups start to split apart when you do that. But you talk to the, to the people who come in and make noise, and you ask them about it, and they'll say, well, no, we're, we want to be the friendliest church in town. We want to greet everybody. We want people to be happy. You know, so you, you get the groups together and you say, you know, sit in a circle and you say, well, how can we accommodate everybody? How can we make this work for everybody? Um, and, and so basically what's happened in congregations that have used this, you know, in, with this example, because it's shown up several times, um, you know, they'll decide, okay, what we're going to do is those of us who want to greet everybody and love doing that, we're going to stay out outside of the sanctuary until about two minutes before service starts. And we'll greet everybody as they come in and we'll make them feel welcome and we'll be happy and then we'll get quiet and we'll go in. Um, and, and the quiet people say, you know, well, we want to greet all those people too, but can we do it after service? You know, because we love to, to be friendly. We, we want to be a friendly church too. So we'll do it after service. And all of a sudden, the two groups now are working together as opposed to um, disliking each other. Because if, if I'm one of the quiet people and you're one of the noisy people, but we're going to be voting on something in the church, or we're going to be working on something, and you have an idea. I don't like your idea from the fact that it's coming out of your mouth. Because I don't like the fact that you disturb my service. I mean, that happens, and it splits churches. Um, and, and people end up moving and going to a different parish or going somewhere else. Because it happens. Because we don't have those discussions. So that's why they're using it, is to try and surface those kinds of things as well. Um, I'm sorry, I'm running you guys over way more than you want to be, I'm sure. Um, again, I'm not offended if anybody needs to go, um, but I'll, I'll stay with you as long as you want. Does that program have a name to it that you were kind of referencing? Does it have like a certain name within the Yeah, I think they, the, it's either kindness or civility <coughs> service. K kindness or? Or civility okay. service. You know, at, 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 at the adult level, we talk about it as being civility service, but for the kids, we talk about it as kindness service. Um, and, it, and it's pretty simple. I mean, it's, it's a, and, and actually, um, Tom Robbins and I decided that together. And we run it on, we, it actually runs on a computer and the computer kicks out all the stuff to you. But you can do it on paper. Um, you just have to, you just end up doing a lot more number crunching. Because it asks them, you know, they can, they can type in, I mean, they can put Encyclopedia Britannica into something about kindness or something about, about, about meanness. They, they usually don't, but you know, but those are full paragraphs. But the machine will kind of crunch that all, put them in the right, correct order, and put, and put them out to everybody. Um, but it's also important that you have some other form of reporting, some other place where it's safe. Yes, ma'am? What about the bystanders? Um, yeah, we're going to deal with them, too, as, as this is going on. Because um, we're going to talk about these things. We're going to talk a lot to them about it. We're going to, you know, there's a, there are a lot of programs that people talk about being an upstander. You know, if you see something you don't like, Tell somebody about it, or, you know, or, or, or talk to that person directly and say that's not that's not the right thing to do. Um, again, it's trying to say you know we can intervene on these things. You can be a good friend and support your friend, um, but you know we have to be careful what happens with them too. But we have the bystanders need to know, and you have to re recognize that you've got that constellation of interest. You know that you've got some that want to see this keep being steered up. Um, you know, we have others who really want to be supported and have it fixed, but, but that's part of them knowing what this is all about, too. Who, who addresses the bystanders? Does, yeah, the, that, does the, the teacher do it, or does the counselor? Yeah, it should happen with the, the counselor and the teacher working together. I mean, what should happen on something like this is it really becomes, especially if you, if you move towards a restorative system, um, it becomes a school-wide initiative. And some people are going are to take to it right away and be real comfortable with it. Um, other people are not going to like it. They're going to say, you know, that's, you know, that's not, you know, I, I'm used to, um, you know, the rule around the wrist. 
Um, you know, that's, you know, so, so we have to bring them along carefully with that as well. Because it takes people a while to change how they deal with stuff. Um, but um, but that's, that group should be talking all the time about how to, how to improve the climate, improve the culture. Yes, ma'am. When we talk about the school violations of those, how do parents and teachers in that? So if, say, we know something's happening in the classroom, it's going to be addressed in the classroom, but shouldn't the parents all be notified so they can talk about it at home? Oh, sure. Okay. So they should. I mean, that's part of having a trained person who can work with them on it and, and work through that. Um, and, and, you know, it's hard for parents because, you know, some of the things, like a parent wants to know, if I come and report that my child is being bullied, you know, I want you to take care of it. And I want to know what you did to that other kid. Well, you can't tell them that. You know, you're not allowed to tell them that. You know, so, you know, that's, you know, um, those, those are confidential. You can't, you can't say what you've done to this other child. You just have to say, you've got to trust that we're taking care of this. You've got to work with us. Here's how you can work with your child. This is what we're doing there, and try and focus their energy that way. It's tough, because again, we have a punishment mentality. I mean, what I really want you to do is call me up and say, the kid was bullying your kid, we took them off behind the church, and we beat the living stuffing out of them. You know, and, uh, and we're gonna do it again tomorrow and the day after, and you can come watch it. You know? But you're, you're not gonna tell me that. You, know, you, you, you can't tell me what you've done. But that's what you want. You know, that's, that's what you want to hear as a parent. So we've, we've got to get them to think differently too. Yes, ma'am. Back to the bystanders. Um, I think one of the things I've heard from my kids specifically, and I don't know if this is other people's experience, um, that they're afraid that if they stand up for someone or say something, they will become the target. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence to support that? Or you know, does the evidence show that no, actually, if you stand up for someone, you don't automatically become yeah, it's it can vary, but you don't automatically, especially if this if the whole school environment is is, is working, you know, then 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 it's going to be okay. You know, if you're in a place that's not really functional, where they haven't really started to address these things, then yeah, there is a chance that you're going to get caught up in that, and it's hard. You know, that's a hard place to be. You know, to do that, but it's it it can make such a difference, um, and there and there are ways that people. Um, have, have done you know programs with kids of getting them to understand um, ways to say something to somebody that's not just going up and saying what you did to that person is not right you know to, to, to do it in a little bit different way um, in a workplace um, the Vanderbilt Hospital did a program that they called the cup of coffee program which basically is if you see somebody treating another employee or, or doing something that you don't think is appropriate before you come to HR and report it and do the whole big deal with this thing, um, if you come to the table, have a cup of coffee with them and sit and talk about it and say, I, I saw you do this the other day. I don't, I don't know if you know that that has implications or that could be a problem. And they've, they've done pretty well with that, of people kind of working with each other on that level. Yeah. Are there any programs or resources for kids that they could be taught in the classroom or in other settings about ways to respond on social media or texting mm -hmm. that are kind ways to support people who are being bullied without making them feel like they are becoming a target, like to train, because you know, yeah. I, I tell my kids, oh, say this, and they're like, mom, nobody would ever say that. <laughs> that sounds like a 40-year-old woman. I'm not frightened at, <laughs> you know? Are there I, resources to help I'm sure there are, but I don't, I, I, I don't know of any. Um, part of that, I'll tell you, is that because of I've been working in this area since like 2002 and, and you know, working through this, I'm a social media conscientious objector. Um, I do not have Facebook accounts. I don't have any of them. My wife has, um, but I don't have any of that. Because I've, I've watched what it does to, to people, what it does to kids. You know, and how the problems are. But I'm not telling you that it's all, that's almost impossible to do. But we do have to find better ways to work with them. Um, there have been a couple of places that have tried having internal systems. Um, you know, and, and the diocese at one point was talking about that, about having kind of like a Facebook for all the kids who live in the archives, the schools that they could monitor and work on. Never, never got that far, but a place where the kids might be a little bit safer. Um, 
But again, they, they can do stuff that we have no idea. Yes, sir. Uh, so you have told this child that you know that they're a good person, we love you, here's a trophy, you know, we know you can do better, and he does it again, and again, and again. Where do you draw the line? Well, we've got to find out what the underlying issue is. But once, uh, yeah, once we find that. Is, is two years enough? You can do it, you can do it faster than that. In the meantime, um, in the meantime, what happens to the children? Yeah, it's, well, you, you can correct the kid. Sometimes you can correct the kid in a couple of days. So nowhere in your opinion is there a reason to maybe, well, you know, not that Well, there may be, so, I mean, we have some few paths and such paths, so there's not a lot we can do about that. You know, I mean, there's some people that you cannot change. Um, you know, one of, one of the problems in our prison system, because we have way too many people in there, is we lock up people that we're mad at, not people that we're afraid of. You know, if we lock up only the people we're afraid of, we'd have about 15% of the prison population, you know. You know, ones we're mad at, we'd be trying to work with them in a different way. Um, but that doesn't mean you're not gonna, we're, you're not, you, we're gonna protect the kid who's being bullied if we're doing this right. We're gonna work to try and save the kid who needs to be saved. And we're gonna get all the rest of the kids to everybody else to be supportive of that and to be working towards that if we can. And that will include it. But you can't, you can't necessarily do it overnight. And we are gonna have kids that are absolute repeat offenders. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to know what we do with them. Sometimes it, it, there really is a point where you have to remove somebody from where they are. I mean, if they're, if they're infecting everybody else, you know, if they had tuberculosis, we'd get them someplace where we could treat them, uh, keep them from infecting other people, we, you know, and, and, and help them. Um, and we would help them there, but not in a situation where they could keep, could keep infecting, infecting people. So that's part of how you have to work with this. And you've got to look at that and say, We've got to stop them from hurting others, um, but we don't have to give up on them. We can find a way to, to try and do something for them. But again, because you have parents involved in it, there's a point where maybe you can't. You know, maybe. Um, but you know, all too often what happens is we, we, we kick them out and they go somewhere else, and we just pass the problem around. You know, it just goes from school to school to school to school as opposed to somebody trying to intervene and see if they can help them. Um, used to be, which you can't do anymore, um, used to be at least for, for boys, um, when they got to be 17, that, you know, when I was growing up, when I was that age, you know, if you had trouble, the judge gave you a choice. It was Army, Navy, or Reform School. Um, you know, the military did a really good job of, of, of straightening out people who had issues because they, they dealt with it in a different way. But we can't do that yet. Um, but I think, again, you know, we've got we've to protect the kids as best we can. But it also, we don't want to just punish the ones who are wrong. Um, we want to help correct them if we can. Are there any other questions I can answer? Yes, ma'am. In the kindness program you were talking about, is it appropriate to um, train all of the teachers, or do you train oh, you a train group them. of them? Oh, or you train them all. Pull them all in. Oh, yeah, we train them in an hour. I mean, it's just basically learning how to ask questions mm -hmm. and how um, to not make a lot of statements, but ask questions. Is this to look and say, if, even if there's one report of something, say a mean thing, you know, teach them to say, you don't want to say it was, we had one report of, because then everybody wants to say who did that. So what you say is, well, we had several people say that they thought doing this was mean. You know, what do you mean by that? What is, what's mean about that? And we want to talk about it. I know what's mean about it. Teacher knows what's mean about it, but let the kids to talk about it. Do what the kids the usually speak up? Like if there's an issue going on in a class, say it's a mm -hmm. third grade class, and there's a, a kid that's not being so kind. Do kids usually speak up, the ones that are being mistreated, or I mean, will they usually offer that? If they feel safe. If they have a safe way to let you know. But one of the things in the kindness stuff is they'll write it out there. You'll see it show up there. And then you can go in and try and figure that out. As who to find. And every teacher knows which kids in their class they can, they can talk to on the side. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you always know there's a couple you can say, hey, tell me what's really going on. I won't tell anybody, you won't be in trouble. What's really going on? You say, because we want to we fix this. And they, they will. But you have to know what's going on before you can ask them what, yeah. what it is. Oh, is there anything else I can do? 
Do you think yes, support sir. group for parents would be helpful or? Oh yeah, I think it'd be very, very helpful, especially if you do that, um, if you do it in a circle, um, like, a, like a witnessing circle, mm -hmm. where um, people can tell their stories, other people listen to them and hear them, you know, and that, that could be taught very quickly as a way of getting people to communicate and, and talk. Um, circles are really special. Um, I don't know if you've used them, um, but the whole notion of using a circle is, is, is ancient. It comes from when we sat around campfires and you know we shared stuff and everybody was equal. Um, people didn't have stuff in front of them. And, you know, you're in a, you're in, and we can share, we can share stories as long as people will listen to each other's stories. Because we, we all have our stories. Um, that's, we have, by the way, that's how we learn. We learn from stories. You know, if you think about the great, the, the great religious texts, you know, the, the Torah, the Quran, the Bible, they're, it's a collection of stories. It's, you know, it's not a collection of facts, it's a collection of stories. And that's how we learn. Um, the, the most compassionate thing you can do for someone is to listen to their story. And to listen without judgment, to let them tell you, to just, to, to hear it, you know, to, to take it all in. And, um, and ask them questions about it so you fully understand it. I mean, I do a lot of work on active listening. You know, and if you do that within a circle group and get people doing that, um, you can you can really learn a lot from each other and feel very close. And you get to you get people who now hear hear your story, and um, and you've heard theirs, and and it makes it makes a huge difference. Um, the last thing I want to say because I do want to let you guys go, um, but is that some of this is is really trying to be change your mindset. Um, you know we we the. Job is to protect children. Job is for us to protect all children. Um, to do the best we can for all of them. To not just decide, well, we're going to dispose of some because they're little jerks, and we're going to just take care of the others. But to try and figure out how do we work with all of them. Is that part of, you know, how many children are there you have? Or how many are there? You know, it's part of that. The other part of this, I think, is really important. Is, um, and it really comes from, from, from from Jesus Christ when he walked the earth, um, who talked about love. He talked about how important love was. Um, and talked about it in a way that we still have trouble with. You know, we still have trouble doing it. Um, we, um, I believe, you know, you hear oftentimes in churches and things, um, people will say that, that God is love. You know, and that's a good thing. You know, you hope it is. You know, because in, 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 in the Old Testament, God, God was vindictive, uh, but you know Jesus came and said, you know, God was love, and when we think about that, but I, I think about that a different way. I think about it in a way of saying that I think that love is God. That that the closer you can get to to pure love, you know, and, it, and I don't know if any of us can get there. He he did, but I don't know if any of the rest of us can. But closer you can get to to pure love, the, the more godlike you are. Um, and and only. That can only happen if you do that. So the last thing I want to say to you is having worked with you and seen you and watching all your faces and the fact that you've come out and you care about this, is I want to tell you that I love you all. I love every one of you in here. And there's nothing you can do about that.